recently Mr. Scullagrim in Canada tested a, a bronze kopesh and uh, it created quite a lot of interest and uh, quite a lot of views as well. As the maker of that sword I, I thought it was quite interesting because I've seen my swords tested before by archaeologists but to be honest it was done better in the YouTube film than anything I've ever seen on archaeologists do. And the reason was, Mr. Scullagrim understands swords and he knows how swords are used and he has a better vision of this. The problem I've had in the past is archaeologists are a bit limited in the use of swords. There are some that are very knowledgeable, but the majority of them, it's, uh, it's not their specialist field and it's not something you can learn by reading a book. So I've got a lot of respect for you, Mr. Scullagrim. Because what you did was fantastic and you also put it out there that everybody can see it. So what I thought I'd do is give you a sword to test, which is my favourite sword. And it's uh, probably one of the swords of the late Bronze Age in Britain. In front of me I've got some uh, fragments of a uh, leaf blade sword. And they all belong to what's called a Ewart Park sword. But the leaf shaped form has been around for a long time and it's developed right from the probably about 1000 BC, the idea of this designer blade has uh, gradually been developed and through improvements in the casting technology the design has changed. So the last version of it is called the Ewart Park, but the earlier version was called the Ballantober Sword, which didn't have a tang up here. Then it was uh, similar to this, which is a uh, Wilburton type sword. And it's got this beautiful wide blade here and then it tapers down. It's got a very stylish handle. This sword, the Wilburton sword, and this sword are basically the same sword, but they're separated by several hundred years. A bit this is later, so it's more developed. And very prolific. Between these two swords is probably about 2,000 of these swords in museums, in private hands, and there's probably in the summer a piece of one found every week by a metal detector somewhere. They are that prolific. A modern comparison would be something like the AK-47. It is a very popular sword. No other sword type in the British Isles can match this number. This is really huge numbers. Partly because bronze lasts forever in the ground, or comparatively, but also it must have been immensely popular. There must have been an awful lot of this type of sword in circulation in the Bronze Age if we've got so many today. These were big swords in their time, so you've got to remember that. The interesting thing is the handles on these are far more involved Whereas the later swords have simpler handles. And the interesting thing is these earlier swords are cast through the points. So they're cast upside down and the handles are more elegant because the bronze doesn't have to pass through it. But the problem they realise is that by casting it this way it's creating uh, flaws in the blade. And they realise that if they could cast it the other way round, cast it through the hilt, which happens, you get a much stronger section of blade here. It's the way bronze fills a mould and sets. As it goes from liquid to a solid it shrinks. And if you can't feed the shrinkage you end up with the structure of the bronze being slightly stretched or porous and it creates a weakness. So the first thing they do is instead of casting it through the tip they change it on this and they cast it through the handle. So you can look here, this is one that's all finished. And without the handle shells on, it would have gone in there. So this is the thickest part of the sword, and it would be the nearest to the pouring cup. Because if we cast it through the tip, the thickest part of the sword will be the furthest away, and it would cause problems. The next thing I want to show you is the blade section. So we're going to use expensive graphics. Okay, the earlier swords were flatter blades with big mid ribs to give it the extra strength. But later on, they go to this 
lens shape section which is starts in the Wilburton sword which is this type of sword. The problem is it makes it heavy. This blade is nice and thin with a rib and the weight's down so when they move to this it starts to make them a bit heavier than they want. Remember all Bronze Age swords are quite light. The majority of them are under a kilo. So what they do very cleverly is they remove the blade just a little bit and create this soft midrib in there. So they keep the strength but they lighten the blade by losing these sections here. To make the blade more usable. I found this fascinating because it's actually a lot more work for a caster. The lens shape blade is much easier but these uh, I think they're called lenticular section blades are much lighter. It's similar in strength to the lens shape but uh, a lot more work for the bronze caster. So we're looking at a um, piece of Ewart Park sword. This is quite a late sword. It's probably around 800 700, 600 BC. It's hard to date swords. But the interesting thing is this is the soft midrib I was talking about. Rather than it being um, lens shaped, they've lightened it on these two sections to save weight. This line here, this is the edge of the sword where it's been forged down in antiquity to produce a hard, thin wafer of bronze which holds an edge quite nicely. So I've incorporated this in the test sword and the same with the, the forged edges. The earlier section of sword, which is this, I'm going to compare it to there. So you get it. So it's just starting to come in as the idea of um, lightening the blade. They're trying to keep the weight down to about four, well, probably 500, 600 grams for a small sword like this at most, probably 500 and maybe even lighter to 500. So it gives you an idea of, of the way they're developing. Whereas here it gives you an, an idea of what the blade would look like with the handle fitted, riveted on. Right, so the sword that's come into uh, Canada, we've got the wide rib down the middle, and it's got the edges forged but I've also added some other tricks to it because sword makers would have done this themselves. First thing I've done is I've actually artificially bent the blade and straightened it to work hard on the bronze a bit to make the blade more rigid because I don't want it to bend if it's struck on something. So I've bent the sword several times like this and it's and it's stiffened the blade up. I did something similar with the capesh otherwise it will bend. So it's a trade-off. The more you stiffen it up as a blade, the more chance it's going to be nearer its fatiguing point. So it's a, a trade-off. Nobody's done this kind of experiments before, so I was trying to up the uh, game a bit and make it more interesting. The other thing I've done is I've work hardened into the blade. I've seen this on fragments of swords in museums where they've hammered the actual blade itself, which was a common practice with um, axes and knives and things like this. But they've done it on some of these swords. They've hammered down on both sides, and that's what these funny marks are here. Of course, on the finished sword, you wouldn't see it, but because this is going to be uh, tested until it sort of suffers, I thought I'd leave them in so you can actually see them. So these are hammer marks here, hammer marks and hammer marks. So you've got the, the forged edge which makes it quite hard on the edge. But this will actually stiffen the blade and make it a more usable sword. It's not fair to compare these to a steel or a sword in a way. But if you look at the early iron swords, they had a major problem of trying to get iron hard enough to make a, a decent sword and it's only when steel gets introduced that you get a much better sword. So bronze swords in a way were actually very good but no one arrived. It must have been a, a difficult thing to, as a new material and it's not an, an immensely hard material and you have to remember that iron is not steel. So bronze swords were in use for quite a long time. 
and it takes a while for iron to the technology of it to ve develop in this country and be made into swords so by hammering down the blade like this it's stiffened the blade up more and more and more to make it a functional sword the weight of this sword I think is somewhere around 650 grams so that's still actually quite heavy for this type of Bronze Age sword um, quite a few of them will be down towards um, maybe 550, 570 grams so they are a light sword and there's a good chance they were used with a shield as well so it's quite an agile sword Right, so we're going to take the sword apart here, so the pommel fits on like this and then we're going to wiggle it apart. This is how they were fitted. Bronze rivets and the head's hammered over. Because this sword's going to be tested, I've kept it fairly simple. So you can see, so this is where the feed was. Quite often you can actually see where they've broken the feed off there. Some of them have different feed ribs or lines or things like this, all to try and improve it. I haven't cleaned this one up immensely, I've just basically cast it and hammered it. But you can hear the hardness of the blade. Technically these are probably very good. If you looked at Bronze Age swords, you'd say this is a particularly good sword. So it'd be up in the sort of better end of the sword. And some swords would have been soggy and some would have been brittle. But it, it's obvious that the sword needs to be functional. They wouldn't make it. And they wouldn't put so much work into it if it wasn't to be functional and used. One of the stranger things I've seen in a museum was that wooden handles like this had a lead weight added underneath to increase the weight of the sword so it would tip the balance of the sword more towards the hand. So if they were going to this level to balance the sword they must have been very very serious about them. So they must have been very functional. How they were used nobody really knows and it's not really my uh, department on how these swords are used. So, but the thing I personally feel is they were most probably used with the shield. So we've got one here. This is a, a, a copy of a Bronze Age shield, which is an idea of what they look like. And so, after this, I'm at a loss. I can make them, but I have no idea what you're doing with them. So, over to you in Canada, see so what you make of them.